Hi everybody, welcome to another episode of Tilly Talks. We're here today at Rainforest Floor in Torrance, California, and we're going to talk about some of the Tillandsias that I'm taking to a presentation I'm giving tonight down in Orange County to the Saddleback Bromeliad Society. So these are the plants I'm taking for their plant table and uh, there's some really nice hybrids, colorful plants coming into bloom. But before we start with those, Barry gave me this one that he found hanging in one of the displays and said, do we have to show this tremendous Caput Medusa hybrid? It very well may, it may be a hybrid of um, Caput, you guys are all stuck together here, uh, and Capitata Marone. And you can see how that makes sense. You have the color of Capitata Maron and you have the leaves, sort of the shape of Caput Medusa. And the leaves are straighter than their normal Medusa. They're not quite as curly, which would also reflect the Capitata Maron heritage. The other possibility would be Flavolata. Uh, I'm gonna go with Capitata Maron. Okay, yeah, the, so. the leaves are just so beautifully dark. I think cop out well, They have a lot of color, yes, Barry. They have Beautiful. a lot of color, and the shape is terrific. You can see how the leaves recurve. People like that a lot. And uh, now back to Capitata Marone. Uh, very thick, succulent leaves, and uh, will grow in full sun in the tropics, no problem. Uh, up here, the air is drier, so we have to be a little more careful about the light. Uh, but a terrific plant. Not a lot of them around. And here we have. This looks like uh, Victoria, and I got this one a number of years ago from a lady in Houston named Molly Sheffield, and she was a great lady, a great collector, and she had this form of Victoria, which is a hybrid of uh, Brachycolis and Iananthus, and you can see it has a bit of an orangish color to it. The, uh, the leaves have a lot of trichomes on them, and it's just coming into bloom. Very beautiful little plant, and here's another one. It's a little smaller, but the flowers are out. You can see this. This is when it's in full bloom. So that's it for tonight. Another one. This one is Tillandsia Naturally Gorgeous. Wow. Uh, Streptophila by Abdita. And see, there's a lot of the influence of Streptophila in this one. It will get more color. It has a different shape than a normal Streptophila. Leaves are straighter. It's more compact at the top and uh, just getting ready to flower. Beautifully bulbous. Yeah, that's the, the pseudobulbous aspect is really nice on this one. And then we have, well, Tillandsia Showtime is getting to be a staple now. We've had it for a number of years. This one hasn't started to color up yet, but what is really nice is you can see the purple margins, if you can get in close, you can see the purple margin on the leaf sheet here. So you have a lot of purple, a lot of the silver from the trichomes on the sheet, and then you get the, the beautiful green of the blades. And this one, as it comes out, will get a lot more of a rose color than it gets from Streptophila and Bulbosa. And here we have a small Tillandsia Awesome Amber, which is a hybrid of Rothii and Con color. And Rothii, of course, gets quite large and much larger than con color. So this is a combination of the two. This plant can also get quite large, uh, well over 30 centimeters over a foot. Uh, this one decided to bloom when it was about 30 centimeters. And this one is called Tillandsia Kaibong. <laughs> I don't know where Kaibong comes from. I think it's Australia. It sounds like an Australian Aboriginal name. The Kaibong is an a hybrid of Stricta and Ixioides. And uh, you can see the, the pale floral bracts that Ixioides has, and then the yellow of Ixioides flower with the blue of Stricta gives you this sort of pale violet color on the flowers themselves. The leaves are softer than Ixioides, but thicker and larger than uh, Tillandsia stricta, so an interesting hybrid there. And here we have Tillandsia flabellata. This is the green form. There's also a, uh, a red form. 
and the leaves on this one are green and it has multiple spikes that are very tall. You almost would think it's separate inflorescences, but it's not. There's a common uh, rachis at the bottom and all the spikes are attached to that. They come up separately and they produce the standard purple subgenus Tillandsia flower like you find on a bulbosa, medusa, juncea, inanthicon color. Uh, but a nice plant. And then we have, this is Tillandsia velutina. Velutina is very popular because of the velvety leaves, the thick succulent leaves that it has. It's normally kind of an olive gray green, but when it blooms it turns a beautiful red and gets the standard subgenus Tillandsia blue purple flowers on it. Easy to grow, but don't let it stay moist at the base because it can rot that way. And this is a new form of Tillandsia funkiana. Wow! And you can see how tall it is. Uh, it's also the thin form. There are two or three forms uh, that we have, and this is a thinner form, but beautiful plant. And just getting ready to flower, you can see how it's turning red at the top of the plant. And what else do we have? This is a gorgeous plant. This is Tillandsia ready, named after the lady that's done a, a lot of our Tillandsia work for the last 35 years. Uh, Tillandsia ready is a hybrid of Streptophila and Concolor. And you can see the shape is just exquisite. Beautiful. The leaves come together at the bottom underneath. The proportion of the plant is, is fabulous. There are many, many spikes. And not every plant that's already is going to look exactly like this. And that's another point in Tillandsia. Um, a lot of people on the internet will sell plants. Uh, they can sell that you are going to get this actual plant. And if you're working in your backyard and you've got plants and you sell them and you have the time, you can do that. But normally, you put up a representative plant variation, especially in hybrids, is quite a bit because the parents of the hybrids can vary one to the other. Excuse me, I take that back. <laughs> Not the parents, the seedlings, right? So you have the two parents and they can be very different looking from each other and then the seedlings will grow up and they'll look more like one parent or the other or right down the middle like both. Just like people. How about that? So but, but the they pups don't all look like this. The pups of this one will look like this one. Exactly. The pups of this one will look like this one. So that's a because it's a vegetative offset, not a, a sexually produced seed. That's the difference. Okay. Uh, this one. Yeah. Well, okay, now this is also a Tillandsia ready. So you can <laughs> see the difference between the two. Uh, a lot of difference. This one is obviously more attractive and it's more expensive. This one's blooming, it's smaller, it's still a beautiful plant. If you didn't see this one, you'd say, oh, that's a really great plant. But then when you see this but, one, you say, oh, I want one of those. But the one in your uh, left hand has more streptophila type DNA and the one in your right has more con color, right? Exactly, yes. You can be exactly right, Barry. They're both they beautiful. They curve as much. Uh, it's a lighter color, more like con color. And the shape of the leaves is more like con color. So there you go. And, uh, is that a blooming stramidia? I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. Yeah, whoops. Whoops. Over here. <laughs> yeah, here we go. This is a blooming stramidia, uh, probably about, I don't know, 12, 14 years old. Uh, the inflorescence can be a beautiful, bright, uh, sort of a violet or mauve color. Uh, this one, it's more pale. The flowers are wonderfully fragrant. Mm. You know, it's too bad that uh, you don't have a perfume like this, but the, uh, <laughs> Flowers of Straminia are very fragrant. When a flower on a Tillandsia is fragrant, it is moth or butterfly pollinated in nature rather than pollinated by hummingbirds like most of them. Most of them have bright colors attractive to hummingbirds. There are those that have a great scent and then they pull in the moths and the butterflies to pollinate them. So Straminia, this is a, a rather small one for what they can be. They can grow to be, oh, at least 80, 90 centimeters in height or width, close to three feet, two to three feet in height and width. They can grow to be really, really large. And maybe one of these times we'll show one of those. But this is a nice one that people can put. Uh, you want to be careful with this one and for the cold. Uh, it doesn't do well at freezing temperatures. And also, uh, you don't want it to stay too wet for too long. Yeah. It's one of the species at the front end of 
when will they rot? This one will be sooner than a lot of the others. So it likes to be dry. Uh, be careful in hot, humid climates, for instance, where it rains a lot and they stay wet and they don't dry and it's hot. Um, that's hard. So if you're drier air, it's cooler, and they have a chance to be dry, then Strominia is one of the best plants you can have. Another great one is Tillandsia bulbosa gigante. These are small seedlings, uh, I don't know, five or six years old, but these can grow to be up to 60 centimeters. I mean, they can get to be really, really large. It's a wonderful plant, and bulbosa turns a bright red in the upper part of the plant when it blooms, and it gets the purple flowers. So this is a great plant. And, uh, and then we have Intermedia, uh, which is this one. Right here, I'll show you, here's a couple of them just to show the shapes can be different. This is a species that in nature grows upside down and then it offsets out of the flower spot. It offsets axially at the base of the plant as well, but it offsets out of the inflorescence so that over the generations you get a whole chain growing. We have a clump of this in the back here. It's about 10 feet, about over three meters tall and a meter thick. It's pretty amazing. And Paul, is that what they call viviparous when they, yeah, when they when offset, they offset the spike? the flower spike, that's, that's called viviparous or viviparous nuts. Okay. <laughs> and what else? Let's see, what else? Caput medusa is a standard in the industry, uh, mainly because it grows in nature in Guatemala and it provides a lot of the world trade. You know, the trade in these is based on plants collected out of nature and Medusa is one of the popular ones that comes from there and has a great shape. But it, you need to be careful with this one because it'll rot more easily than many of the others. If the base gets wet in here, it's inside the house, it'll rot pretty quickly. So be careful to keep it dry. The way to do that is to dunk it in good water for a few seconds once or twice a week, hold it upside down for three or four seconds and then put it back. If it's outside, just hose it down. And in nature, these normally grow anywhere from sideways to upside down, so they can't collect water in the base. Any of these pseudobulbous ones like this, you don't want to have a lot of water sitting at the base for a long time. But Paul, you seed grow and grow from offsets all your plants in California, right? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, although that one was brought in, you know. <laughs> but most of them we grow. This is a hybrid called Something Special, Con Color by Intermedia. So I don't have a con color here, but the awesome amber is like a big con color. Isaac Joge is a, a hybrid of Compressa and Rothii, but it looks like a con color. Uh, so if you take con color and you cross it with, uh, what was the other one? Intermedia. Intermedia. So you cross it with Intermedia, then you get this one, which is called something special. And you can, again, you can see both parents. It's one of the joys of the hybridization of the Talantias is to see how the, how the seedlings are going to grow up, which parent are they going to look like, and combining the characteristics of both parents in the hybrid itself. So, that's enough for today, folks. www.rainforestlore.com. Thanks, Thank, Barry. Thank you, See Paul. Bye-bye. Thank you.